This is Jeffrey Fox, and we're doing the introduction to deep learning and optimization, which is part of a collection of introductory material for this semester's AI First engineering course. So first we set the scene um, quite broadly. Uh, when it comes to optimization, it's a pretty old field. Academically, it preceded statistics. Um, there were now, of course, many famous fruitful departments of statistics, but optimization was before that, mainly for industrial problems. <coughs> In fact, you can now, some as well point out, you can say everything's an optimization. When you make decisions at the beginning of the day, or even when you make you know, your life forming decisions, you're optimizing. You're optimizing something, your happiness, your money, um, whatever you, you happen to be optimizing at the time. When um, the lion is chasing you in the uh, field, um, your eye is uh, optimizing the picture of the lion, and your mind is uh, optimizing the chances you will survive and escape the alarm by climbing up a tree or jumping over a fence or whatever you do. Now we of course just uh, looked at, we just had an election which was trying to make the optimal choice of a president where the objective function was actually quite complicated. It had suddenly climate, healthcare, COVID, economy, foreign relationships, personal uh, charisma and things like that. This is called multi-objective optimization, which is actually quite hard because, uh, <coughs> as you see in the election discussions, optimizing these different things is often in contradiction. Also, uh, politics illustrates another key feature of optimization, well, namely false minima. These are minima or optimal, uh, optima, which are locally sound. If you make small changes, you stay in that. Uh, Minima, but if you make a big, you can make a big change, which will make the minimus more minimum. Namely, you can make do things better. You can see that in elections, for example, when incumbents uh, have a huge advantage, even if the challenge is clearly better, and even in some sense, even the the, the um, two-party system uh, also illustrates that it is very hard to this larger party. Because there's a certain, um, even though there might be a different party which would be better, the uh, that different party cannot over over make the change because of the way people vote A or B. And if they really don't like A, they're not gonna they vote for B because B is more likely is the best chance of beating A. Now deep learning is essentially an optimization method, a new one. It wasn't there when I started optimization. And it is replacing or supplementing general machine learning. Um, and it is significantly better than previous methods, whether they were machine learning or not. Uh, we can see it uh, revolutionizing image recognition for autonomous vehicle, vehicles and other types of image problems, analyzing uh, surveillance data for faces and things like that, voice recognition, translation, the recommender systems used by Amazon and Netflix to tell you what to do. I've already mentioned images, cars, cars have, have image devices that take images, telescopes do, microscopes do, lots and lots of things produce images. And so uh, deep learning has had a significant success and focus on uh, images. For instance, in medicine, and analysis of MRI images with deep learning to look for cancers and things like that has been hugely successful. Another type of data which is distinctive and has its own deep learning methods is sequence data. Their uh, speech is sequence, or these audio um, signals I'm producing, they can be thought of as a sequence of pressure waves which then get translated into um, some digital form which then get analyzed to convert the, the digital audio signals into, uh, into words. And it does that by learning from previous recordings of people's voice. And when we look at uh, deep learning, if you were doing this a few years ago, I suspect you would do it theoretically, uh, understanding the fundamental uh, 
issues which give you deep learning, or, or shall, I should say, uh, uh, n applied neural nets. But most discussions, and this is what we do, define it operationally. They just, here is deep learning. Go PyTorch or TensorFlow, and here is what it's good doing. That's how we will discuss it here. Yeah, I mean, it's not that the other method is not very important. It is, but I don't think it's necessary to actually use deep learning. We will focus on how to use it, where to use it, and how to make it work well. Thank you. Let's uh, move on. Well, this one is, uh, we're not going to read this one. It's, uh, I, I, there is a well-known publication, medium.com, and also you just browse the web. Uh, I have uh, collected together uh, what I would call the educa some educational links in the deep learning area. And they um, um, include uh, Andrew Ng's uh, Stanford lectures, which are offered through Coursera, um, the MIT courses. Um, here is some. Here is a a blog on 10 deep learning methods or you need to apply the top 10 AI and data science books. Six books you must read to learn AI, cheat sheets, AI and mathematics. Three year plan to learn the mathematics behind deep learning. Um, uh, an introduction to data science and applications. Understanding neural nets. Brief introduction to DeepMind's latest AI, machine learning for beginners, six deep learning models, comprehensive introduction to autoencoders, understanding neural nets, variational autoencoders, and here we have a two-part discussion of uh, sequences. So you just can you can click at those. I mean, obviously the amount of information on the web is incredible these days, especially in this area because it encourages people to write these blogs and there's a pretty good system for this, for this getting the word around which are the good blogs. The second slide is a more formal method. There's the uh, Andrew Ng's course again, that's so important. And um, here is um, another fellow, Jason Brownlee, which has lots, he has lots of useful introductory blogs and tutorials on machine learning and of course deep learning. Uh, Coursera has um, a deep learning specialization, which uh, at least on January 26 was free for the first seven days, and then it was uh, then you would have to pay. And they claim you can do everything in deep learning for five hours per week. I did put here the contents of that Coursera course, and effectively we'll do most of the contents here. Uh, <coughs> they define deep neural nets and deep learning, which is what we're doing now. Then they tell you how to build them in an efficient fashion with various tricks. We will do that, like dropout and batch normalization. Um, the various different optimization methods, we won't actually discuss that in detail. Um, but we will mention that they exist. This, exist. And uh, so they do something we don't do, which is how to look for bias and things like that. And we will certainly tell you how to make a neural net in TensorFlow. Um, here they're talking about errors, which are very important. How to reduce the errors, how to adjust the, you know, find the right training set to get good answers. Uh, transfer learning is pretty important. It allows you to train on one problem and apply it to another. Namely, if you lived in a world which only had polar bears and you had to actually decide what to do about that line, your your brain would do transfer learning for lines pretty quickly. Convolutional neural nets is the next course. That's the net, net box used for images. And here's the other one I mentioned, sequence models. That's the fifth course. So we will do both CNNs and sequence models. So that's that's that. Uh, that's the end of the sort of I mean introduction to the web. And I say I don't think I can compete with all these people here. They are so good. These some of this material and. Um, Obviously, you can find it either from my list or just by typing it at Google or typing it as a search engine, I should say, and see what the search engine gives you. All right, here is actually a slide I took from MIT, which has deep learning in one slide. 
So what does deep learning? Well, people emphasize it extracts patterns. It also does regression, and we calculate numbers. But uh, you can think of a, a number as a pattern. And it uses, as I pointed out, optimization. And it, uh, the technology it uses for building the optimization model is neural networks. Um, well, when this was written, uh, it, uh, PyTorch was not uh, obviously popular, so I added that. Anyway, it's Python plus TensorFlow and PyTorch. Possibly MXNet that that's not used as much. Um, well, you do have to find good data. That's the hardest part, because data is hidden by people. And then you need to ask the right questions. Well, that uh, if you're in a, a part of a field, you usually know what questions you want to answer. Although you may not know the questions that deep learning could answer. Um, now is appropriate, because we have lots of data. Big data is here. We have the right hardware with GPUs. There's strong community support. Wonderful, the tools in this field are just amazing. And um, there's been a lot of investment in making this field thrive and advance so fast. Now we've done lots of wonderful little examples, or actually they're probably quite big, now some of them. But we haven't yet produced uh, artificial general intelligence, which is making it look like a human. The, the computer looked like a human, and we don't quite know what that means even. We have made lots of progress. I mentioned face recognition, image classification, speech, class, speech recognition, text-to-speech generation, recognizing handwriting, translating. I mentioned medical diagnosis. That's either through um, image processing or just by analyzing uh, electronic record and lab results. Autonomous cars are coming along quite fast using uh, deep learning. You can have a digital assistant will tell you how to make the next step today. And I say the recommender engines are all dominated by deep learning. And if you play chess or Go, you can certainly use deep learning. Actually, I'm not certain deep learning is for chess, but it certainly is for Go. It could be for chess. It, uh, it's possibly chess was already one by other methods, but so they focused on Go, which was, was did not yield to previous uh, AI techniques. Well, here we start with, uh, we better have a neural net and a deep learning network. Here is the world's simplest one called a multi-layer perceptron, MLP, uh, sometimes called an FCN, a fully connected network. You have input layers, so this allows you to feed four things in. And then it has an, uh, an internal layer, hidden layer, which has six neurons. And then it gives two answers, uh, which are the output layer. And everything, or uh, when you go from layer n to layer n plus one, you get four connections. And so we have a set of connections here, and a set of connections here. And each of these connections has a weight, and the weights are what you determine. Your optimization is optimizing to find the weights. These neurons do things. They have activation attached to them. They either add up numbers, they take the weighted input coming in and add it up, or they um, apply a function to those uh, accumulated inputs. So you come in with a value, get it multiplied by weight, and then you add it here. We will come back to this slide because it's uh, this particular picture because it's uh, it just reminds us what the basic idea is. And then of course uh, we only have effectively three layers here. Some of the more sophisticated image processing have over 200. Um, here is one example which uses such a network that was done by a, a student, JCS. Uh, Kedju Bidicha and Vikram Jadeo, who uh, is his advisor in uh, nanoengineering. And they use this uh, deep learning network to just learn the results of molecular dynamic simulation. So if you like, they were learning multi-particle Newton's laws with a, a, with a potential coming from Schrodinger's equation or something. And they predicted 150 numbers for every simulation, and you fed in five input parameters. And you did uh, what you did was you you created some data by using um, IU or some other supercomputer. 
you run your 5,000 jobs in this case here, and that is input data with answers. That is so-called training data, which you can then use to uh, uh, plug into TensorFlow. I think they, I'm sure they use TensorFlow. And then you determine the weights here. So you have five inputs, 512 the first hidden layer, 256 the next hidden layer, and 150 in the number of outputs is the output layer. Remember in the previous slide we had four here and uh, two here and only one hidden layer. Uh, Emma, the, the modis level perceptron outperforms easily every other ma machine learning choice such as support vector machine. Uh, it's sort of interesting, this, this allows you to calculate the results of a simulation far faster than doing the original uh, computation, actually a million times faster. That's what this fancy formula here says. And um, so we put it on NanoHub, or rather they put it on NanoHub for its use in supporting education. This slide here shows that if you uh, look at the, how good it is, it's sort of perfect in that uh, within the errors of the simulation, which is fluctuates by a few percent inevitably, um, the, you, you can um, get a linear, uh, curve with slope equal to one between the uh, molecular dynamics and the deep learning here. And that was for three different choices. I should note that this is used industrially by General Electric, this basic idea, not for molecular dynamics, but for computational fluids uh, to allow their engineers to design engines. They define the general properties of the engine and, uh, over, um, at the end of the day. Uh, GE runs 200 training, training examples overnight, and then gives the engineer a deep learning network to allow the engineer to, 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 to uh, actually keep designing the um, engine and getting instant speed up. Sort of amazing, it's instant speed up. Okay. Here from the uh, that MIT, uh, uh, lectures which I mentioned already, we have a list of seven uh, neural network types. So this is sort of interesting. Um, a key part of deep learning is that it learns the weight, so it learns the model. At the moment at least, uh, you're gonna make better progress if you tell the uh, deep learning ahead of time what type of model to look at. And here they've got identified seven of the most important models. So feed forward neural nets, that's the uh, MLP, the convolutional networks, the recurrent networks of sequences, so-called encoder, decoder architecture, where you have a, you go to, a, you work out a representation and take that representation to get to the output. A so-called autoencoder, where the input is equal to the output, exact copy. Uh, then what you're more interested in is the representation, which gives you a low parameter description of your system. Generated adversarial networks are very popular because they're the ones that develop, uh, generate the fake images. You can get fake people which uh, are trained on real pictures, but then they can cleverly uh, generate fake pictures which are sort of mold all those other examples together. Pretty amazing idea. Um, <coughs> Then the most, most sophisticated here is reinforcement learning, which is not really for, really is not a weight structure, it is a, a type of way of posing the AI. Here you pose the AI with an agent, and then you're effectively trying to design policies. Well, here's the first three given in uh, larger, uh, Size, and there are the ones actually we we'll spend most of the time on. I've already given you an example of the feed forward network. Here is the um, convolutional neural net. We will give this example later on, actually for this example here. The, uh, this is the MNIST uh, handwriting example. We will give a convolutional neural net for this. Although the example we have, uh, which we'll let you play with uh, later on, is uh, initial example uses feed forward networks. Um, recurrent neural nets, I, I work mainly on those personally, and I use them to describe everything from number of uh, cases of COVID you have every day to the number of earthquakes you have every day. 
but most of the work done in industry is on the on the voice and um, um, examples of the translation and voice recognition, and um, another very important example of recurrent neural nets is seen in the work of ride hailing companies. The analysis of uh, where they should put their riders and where the where the how to route the traffic and things is all done through using largely recurrent neural nets because those are the ones that look at time series. And if you look, think about the heart of a of a ride hailing company, there's time series. You know, you want to know you have a set of people arriving at a particular time, and uh, you need to make certain that you don't have all the drivers at the wrong time. All right, so here is a nice example of a convolutional neural net, and it came from uh, MathWorks. And it, um, it shows how the input, here is a car. It goes through an effectively uh, an encoder architecture to uh, get this uh, to get small, uh, clean representation. And then it goes through uh, a more extensive uh, classification set of uh, networks. So it has many layers. I say you can get up to 200 layers here. In this particular example here, which is the famous one, which effectively is the famous one built around ImageNet, which is this database of labeled images. And when you want to do deep learning, you must have labeled images. This is supervised learning, because you want to have a set of inputs where you know the answer. So you need to know that this uh, thing here is a car, or if you really want, if you were training a network to do something more sophisticated, which type of car was it's a Tesla or a Chevrolet or what have you. Uh, it's probably not too difficult to imagine distinguishing a bicycle from a car, but to tell different cars apart, and actually just to take a, we'll see some pictures later on where they're just chopping up images and identifying buses and cars and things, people. So to find the different types of uh, image is quite non-trivial. Here is this example I mentioned where we have uh, um, an uh, image segmentation example where we have these cars. And then you need to see each of these things is actually does segmentation, these uh, particular image, image processing networks. And they, they do box around what they think is interesting. And they say this is a car with 99.3% certainty, 99.5% here. Um, so 90% 90, 90 over here. Here's a bus with only 84% accuracy, and so on. But anyway, it's pretty interesting that you can actually uh, nowadays just take a complex picture like this with lots of information, in it, and you can probably we can get a more accurate description of the person. The person would not be able to tell you how many cars there were, at least not terribly easily. Even though they would almost certainly be able to recognize these individual blobs as cars or buses. So we can say this is competitive with people. But it's also more precise, because it not only knows which are cars and buses, you know exactly where they are, it can measure their speed and tell you what to do to avoid colliding with them. Here is this. Uh, um, NASNet, one of the more sophisticated ones, um, uh, neural architecture search, um, um, neural net for images, and here it's looking at zebras and chopping up. There's rather, actually, in principle, rather confusing image because the zebras merge into each other, into individual zebras. Here is taking a market and it's breaking up the market into uh, fruit of different types. It's even recognizing the type of fruit, apples with 91%. Uh, here, it doesn't seem to recognize these, um, probably onions here, and bananas here. But it has found all these people with various probabilities. 98% over here, you can really see this person here. 99% uh, for this lady who's looked from the back. And so, you can, and they, it hasn't recognized these beans. Maybe it doesn't have a healthy diet, and um, but still, this is not a trivial thing to do. Over here is even more impressive. We have kites and people, and it's uh, clearly done a good job. Even this here, we have 
these people recognized in the in the water, not so much of a person there. Over here we have an 87% person swimming, and a kite which is just uh, on the edge of the horizon. So, quite impressive. Here's some work I did to use um, recurrent neural nets, a so-called long, uh, short-term uh, memory model, which is uh, the, the the best known of the uh, so-called recurrent neural nets, which allow you to describe time series. And this is looking at uh, 205 days shown here, uh, 314 cities. These particular data are summed over cities. Here are all the cases, and here are all the fatalities. And what's amusing is that this particular neural net has actually seen the weekly structure. If you look at all the reported data, there's an incredibly striking weekly structure because people uh, people's deaths and cases are not reported as reliably on the weekend as they are during the week. Um, <coughs> so it's not perfect. It's um, root mean square errors around four percent or eight percent for the fatalities. And uh, that's you know it doesn't quite reproduce this deep dip here, but part you know, part of this problem is this data is sort of rough. It's full of errors because you know the way they accumulate it, and they they suddenly say, oh we just found some nursing home data, let's add it in. So it's a little rough this data. And if you if you looked at the particular individual cities, you will find that uh, roughness exhibited. You can read my papers to see more about that. Now uh, here while well, here we can. Uh, Look at the ones we're not going to look at in, in more detail. Let's say there are, these are all. Um, we might do encoder decoder architectures because that's very general. I'm I am using that with uh, sequences. Auto encoders. We also I'm using that to look at um, representations, which is so-called dimension reduction. It's a very powerful way of doing that. I have not personally done GANs, generated adversarial networks, to generate fake images. Nor have I, one of my students is writing his thesis on this type of reinforcement learning, but I have myself have not done research in that area. All right, so now we come to a collab. Uh, this um, you need to run your deep learning somewhere. I don't mind, of course, where you run it. You can run it on your own machine if you can. I tend to use Google Collab because it's a uh, for least smaller jobs, it's more than sufficient, and it's basically a cloud resource which is either free or costs nine ninety nine dollars ninety nine cents a month if you want to get some enhanced uh, GPUs and memory, and maybe run an extra job. Um, but obviously, you can also use the IU facilities, which are actually going to get much better. Um, and uh, so it's a it's a cloud. And um, we write, you write your code in Python, but that's the typical way you do all deep learning. Deep learning isn't itself written in Python. It's almost certainly written in C++, the inner core. The thing that does all the work, calculates all those matrices, that's done in C++. But the interface is Python. And then uh, there's a version of the Python interface, which is a notebook. And we will use what it's called, I will use at least, and you are welcome. I would suggest you look at using Jupyter Notebooks, which is a particular web-based environment used to write Python code, which has a pretty good interactive feel to it. It's not perfect, and actually, it does sound, when the job gets too big, it gets a bit ugly. And for this, you'll need a web browser, a Gmail, and you need to go to use Colab. And if you want, you can pay your nine ninety nine a month, but it's not necessary. Um, well, we're going to give you an example, um, and um, but first you could go to the Google Colab, which is this thing here, the welcome um, information, and notice that uh, uh, Colab saves everything in your Google Drive. So that means when you go to one of our Colab examples, you first do a save, a copy, and drive, because we're not going to let you change our examples. 
uh, unless we got the permissions right, then we will be chaos if every user was changing the same file. So you do a save a copy and drive, get your own copy of the web browser, uh, and then you can just edit it, as we'll see an example in the pre-recorded video I have on the last slide. Okay, folks, um, here is a little uh, collab example. One of the th three we have attached to these lectures. This is called the Python warm-up. It just has some really basic uh, Python instructions. What you first do is go to the file and then you say, file uh, menu and say, save a copy and drive. When you've done that, you will get this, which I already did. And uh, as this is yours, saved in your Google Drive, uh, you're in good shape. You can do anything you like with it. So one of the simple things we can do is, well, let's uh, get everything set up. Say factory reset runtime, gets uh, everything cleaned up. And then we can do run all. And these, this little symbol here says it's running. And after a while, it will turn into a number saying that it's already run. One, two, and so on. We could, of course, here do an edit. Um, A equals 27, and then we can rerun this. And uh, we didn't actually print A. Now we have 27 on our list. If we go down there, these are really simple. Python commands, and you can do add whatever you want. As you saw, it's really easy to add things. Uh, this just uh, goes through basic constructs, um, arrays, dictionaries, um, um, comparisons, and so on. And it's, um, well, it just uh, allows you to uh, uh, see what you can do with Python. And you can do, of course, much more sophisticated things, which is what we do, invoking TensorFlow and other things in Colab, uh, SkyKit Learn, and this, things like that. So let's let's assume we can uh, use um, Colab and move on. Thank you very much. Okay, here we are. Uh, this lists the. Um, Three um, collabs which you have with this uh, these uh, introductory introductory um, slides. The one we just did is the Python one. There's also the welcome to to collab one and the one which we'll come to a little later on in the conjunction with these slides here. We will come to the one which just, just tells you how to use convolutional neural nets to um, solve the MNIST problem. Except this one doesn't do that. This one does the fully connected network. The later one will do the convolutional neural net. I apologize for that misstatement. This one might also mention PyTorch as well as TensorFlow. You can run PyTorch on Codelab. Google is very generous. Um, it has got enough things going well for it. It doesn't mind. And Haravad is a parallel computing environment coming from Uber, actually to get better performance. And remember, when you take these notebooks, you well, you either open in what you want. If you want your own Jupyter Hub, you open it in that. Otherwise, press open in Colab, and always make a copy. Save a copy and drive. Thank you very much. That's the end of this uh, particular slide set.